Hi, uh, my name is Jeffrey and uh, I am a graduate student at the physics department. And so my topic will be uh, magnetic force microscopy and its applications. Um, uh, this is actually a research of interest in my research lab. So I will be talking about the MFM in general, but also will be going into more of a uh, application side in the sense that I will also be talking about this, the work that we do in my group. Um, and so uh, the outline that we have here is so, like I said before, we'll introduce uh, the MFM, which is, is just a very shortened version of the magnetic force uh, microscopy, uh, go over a, uh, a small version of its applications that we've used for it so far. Um, then we'll go into the theory and how it works, the how we commercially have made these MFMs. And then we will go into more, as I said before, in depth on where our group's MFM works and the differences that uh, is between ours and a commercial a um, MFM or AFM, really. Um, the advantages of our home built MFM. And then we will go into what's actually important is the data and images that you get from these types of scans. And then any future work involving our, our commercially, uh, our home built MFM or any other group's MFM out there uh, currently working on these type of uh, scanning pro uh, microscopies. Uh, so the biggest question right now is where exactly did the uh, MFM come from? Well, in 1981, a uh, scientist by the name of Heinrich uh, Rohrer and Gerd, yeah, Gerd Benning uh, discovered and created the first SPM or scanning probe microscopy and called it the scanning telling microscopy. Um, basically, this was a first of its kind where we were able to finally see uh, uh, each individual atom on a sample. Um, it's a very, very cool type of technology. Uh, like I said, you can get up to atomic resolution and it almost revolutionized the, the world of science. Um, the problem was uh, with the STM was that it was only, it only worked on conductive materials and you can only do it in ultra high vacuum, uh, which kind of posed a problem because you know, not all materials are conductive and not everything can survive in UHV. Um, so then in 1986, two uh, IBM scientists then created the atomic force micro, uh, microscope, which completely took out the portion of, uh, of the material being only conductive. The only drawback was now you can't get as great as a resolution as the STM, but you can get still you can still get some useful information from the uh, top of, uh, from the topography itself. And in 1987, it was finally taken a, one step further into the magnetic force microscope. And this uh, is just a sort of updated version of the AFM. Um, the AFM and the MFM are essentially one thing since they do since they both scan topography with the only difference that the MFM now uh, you know can scan uh, a can scan a magnetic field at a certain height above the sample that you're looking at. Um, so the usefulness that came from this set you can it can be used in various environments so ultra high vacuum liquid environment at different temperatures and in the presence of a variable uh, external magnetic field and the resolution itself still isn't bad it's around about 50 to 100 nanometers which is the same thing about uh for an afm so the applications that the mfm has helped so far are more importantly uh the use and development of storage devices um you know as we get into more a Oh, we get into more of wanting a bigger storage uh, storage with smaller uh, surface area. The MFM has now helped in developing stuff like that. Um, it also allowed us to um, experimentally study magnetism and see any fundamental issues that arise from it. And stuff like that would be, you know, magnetic domains on thin films or study of nanoparticles. Uh, so before we get into going before we get into uh, knowing how the MFM works, it's probably good to know, you know, as we did in class, about knowing what magnetic domains and domain walls are. So as we said in class before, you know, magnetic domains are just these regions, uh, regions in the sample which the uh, magnetic moments are aligned, either all together or not at all. And the domain walls is where they begin to start separating themselves there. Um, and so, uh, so going to the MFM, uh, we uh, have this cantilever that vibrates at resonance and it approaches the sample. 
And the way to go about doing this is we can see this almost as if a simple harmonic oscillator. And as all engineering and physicists know, we definitely know our simple harmonic oscillator equation and how to go about doing that. Um, and so we can write down the equations of motion. This is where Z is the displacement of the tip. Uh, delta is the dissipation term. You know, omega naught is just the normal natural resonant frequency. K is the hook constant. Uh, this A naught cosine omega T is just the driving term. And then this F, F sub EX is just the uh, external force field. And so after you crank a few, you know, equations and math, we eventually find that the cantilever uh, has a resonant frequency um, that looks like this. And <clears throat> therefore, we can see that the frequency shift is proportional to the force gradient. We're only looking at this in 1D, but if you take it in 3D, then it becomes that it, it's proportional to the gradient of the, of, of the force. But unfortunately, this isn't enough information for it to tell us anything. We need more information about the tip. Namely, we need the information about the magnetic coding of the tip in order to calculate the magnetic field generate, generated by the sample that we're looking at. And the quote unquote uh, simple way to do this is just to integrate the interaction of the magnetic field over the volume of the magnetic coding. Uh, though this is a little bit hard simply because that would uh, require for you to know the geometry of the tip of each individual tip, which simply no one has the capability of doing for each individual tip as a, they're made in, uh, uh, as, a, as a pack of 10. Um, so we can just simplify a few things, um, but we eventually find that, <clears throat> uh, that the potential energy is just, uh, again, assuming that it's only perpendicular uh, to the sample that it's just, you know, negative mz bz right um but if we also look remember that the force is equal to the negative of the gradient of the potential then we find uh, that <clears throat> that the frequency shift is actually proportional to the uh second derivative of the uh, yeah the second derivative of the of the magnetic field again this is kind of crude just because it's simply only looking at um what in 1D and in perpendicular to the surface, but it's still enough to get the information uh, that we need. So how this works is, and like most SPM uh, procedures are, is that we just bring a, a sensor as small as possible, um, uh, close to the sample, as close as we possibly can, and then we spatially resolve it, and then we can just find various uh, things from there. And we use what we call a two-pass technique, and where it scans the surface once, and then in the case of the MFM, um, it lifts it up to a certain height and then scans that same line. So in other words, assuming you can still see me on the camera, is if the sample is my knuckle, uh, my finger is the cantilever, what it does is it'll go over the, the topography of my knuckle, then go back to the beginning, go back up, and then still trace over that same topography so that it still keeps that, let's say, 10 nanometers apart, just so that it can make sure that no other um, forces are uh, involved. And I have a picture of that. And I also have a little GIF that kind of shows exactly what's happening here. Um, so commercial AFM uh, utilizes what we call a beam bounce. Essentially what it is, is the laser that bounces off the back of the cantilever and into this four quadrant photodiode. And then as I showed in the GIF before, it uh, will read the interference and then you know give you a, a topological scan from it. And then here's a picture of our commercial um, AFM that we have in our lab. Um, kind of the big problems with this is the fact that it does stand at about a foot high and roughly about six inches, both width and depth. So with our current MFM, um, here are pictures of it. It actually is extremely smaller. Uh, it's a one inch in diameter and about three inches high. Um, and here's another picture of, you know, the cantilever and the fiber that's behind it. So we use a um, uh, we're out of time. So uh, similarities, you know, clearly it does topography and magnetic images, but the difference is that we have open architecture and we use an interferometer. And of course, it's, it is a lot smaller. The advantages of using this is that it is easier to fix should anything break, which, you know, everything always does in a lab. Um, it's much easier to access the fiber and the cantilever. And it's easier to machine parts should anyone decide to do something like this as well. And as 
we said before, it actually works in various environments. We can put it in UHV, low temperature and external magnetic fields. And so the reason we use an interferometer uh, is simply because it survives, it works well in liquid nitrogen and it's simple enough to work in, in UHV. Uh, a beam bounce like in commercial AFMs, it's just too complicated for it to, uh, to work in, in UHV. Um, and so quickly going over our setup, it's just, you know, uh, we have a laser that goes into a fiber coupler that hits, uh, that goes into an optic fiber, which, you know, as before, as the beam bounce, bounces off the back of the can saver, back into the fiber coupler, into a photo detector, and then that spits out an image for us. And so the important part, you know, that comes from this entire talk is the images that you get from this. So on the left here, we see a, um, a topological scan of a hard drive disk, and on the right you see its magnetic image. So you see the uh, bits that come from uh, from this sort of hard drive. And I think the the lift height about the, about this lift height for this hard drive is about I think roughly uh, fifteen to twenty nanometers. And if you can go a little bit more, uh, okay. So uh, let's try to wrap up in the next thirty seconds. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so uh, as you can see, you can actually get pretty you know, quote unquote, like artistic uh, sort of images, you know, here we uh, in the middle, you see someone's paper and on the right, you actually see data that we uh, acquired from our lab uh, using our MFN on a uranium manganese germanium sample. And then future work, as we already explained before, uh, skirmions, uh, since skirmions have just these important properties. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much. Very interesting talk. Uh, any questions for Jeffrey? Uh, yeah, I've got a question. Um, you were talking about the tips for the MFM and like how they're built in Paxitan. How, how do they build these incredibly tiny tips? Um, if I remember correctly, I think they, uh, I think depending on the company, they, I think they usually chemically etch these things. Um, but as it comes, like I said, it's different for each manufacturer, but I'm not entirely sure how they go about doing this. But as far as I remember, they definitely chemically etch these and then coat them with some sort of uh, magnetic material. 